So uh, thank you everybody for coming and welcome to, uh, to Carleton University for the launch of the 29th edition, uh, this year's edition of Canada Among Nations, uh, edited by uh, Professor Stephen Sademan from the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs and Fen Hampson of the school as well as with CG. Uh, we have with us today uh, three of the authors of chapters in this year's volume uh, and we have uh, for our host, uh, Roland Paris, will be, will be emceeing the event. So we're equally representing two of our colleagues from University of Ottawa and two from Carleton, two from Nipsia. So uh, again, thanks for everyone for coming out. Uh, hope you have an enjoyable time and get lots of questions for our panel and uh, enjoy yourselves and uh, enjoy the lunch and coffee. Um, first of all, let me apologize for um, being a little bit low energy here. I've got a, um, a cold, uh, but we'll get through it. Uh, it's, I'm delighted to be here, and I want to thank you for, for the invitation to participate in the launch of this uh, book. I just got the book myself. It looks uh, terrific. Great lineup of articles. Um, its uh, subject matter is timely, and it's close to my own uh, academic heart, so I really look forward to, uh, to reading the book. Um, we have three of the authors here today, and uh, I'm going to introduce them each uh, just before they speak. Um, we, in terms of format, uh, agreed that they would speak for a maximum of 15 minutes each in their opening remarks, and then we'll have discussion and, and question period. The first speaker is uh, Chris Penny. He's associate professor at NIPSIA, and he's also a reserve legal officer with the Canadian Armed Forces, serving in the Directorate of International and Operational Law in the office of the JAG. His research uh, is on the content and role of international legal principles governing the use of force, and his publications in a number of journal articles and book chapters um, on this subject, uh, um, and he has also provided legal advice in operational military environments, including in Afghanistan and in the NATO headquarters for the uh, NATO-led uh, intervention in Libya. So uh, the title of Chris's chapter is, remind me. That's a good question. <laughs> Working. Legal lesson from the Libyan intervention. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. So mandating responsibility, international legal lessons from the military intervention in Libya. Great topic. Over to you. However you prefer. I'll just stay here. First off, uh, thanks for the introduction, Roland. Uh, I would like to acknowledge before I start uh, the, the efforts of uh, Steve Sademan and, and Fen Hampson in, in pulling this volume together, uh, as well as Benta and others responsible for, uh, for putting this, this workshop together. Uh, I did need to make that disclaimer uh, in the interest of disclosure that I, that I am a, a military officer and I, and I did serve uh, in Unified Protector in Libya. Um, having said that, I'm speaking entirely in a personal capacity. Uh, I, I'm not necessarily representing the position of the Government of Canada or the, the Office of the Judge Advocate General of the Canadian Forces. Uh, I've got no one to blame but myself for what I'm about to say. Uh, and the contribution to the volume, uh, as the title indicates, uh, addressed various strategic legal issues concerning interventions that Canada has been involved with, in particular focusing on the 2000 and 11 uh, intervention by the North Atlantic Treaty Organization in uh, Libya. I'll give you uh, some uh, brief overview of key arguments from the chapter, and then I'll uh, follow that with the application of those lessons in the contemporary context, in particular uh, lessons as they apply to the ongoing intervention by Canada and other states uh, against the Islamic State in uh, both Iraq and uh, Syria. To begin, a, a brief cap, recap of the, the Libyan operation. In February 2011, there was fairly extensive internal unrest in Libya uh, as a result of the larger regional context of the Arab Spring. And that led to fairly significant upheaval and indeed armed conflict between the government and rebel forces that came to be united under the banner of the Transitional National Council. 
international attention was paid to that as as the the domestic uh, issues in Libya became more violent, uh, and subsequently led to military intervention uh, under the auspices of NATO, uh, not only by NATO, there were other non-NATO states involved, uh, but it was a, a NATO-led uh, operation uh, commanded by a Canadian Lieutenant General, uh, Charles Bouchard. Uh, there was a national Canadian contribution to that operation uh, that included uh, a frigate uh, to begin HMCS Charlottetown uh, and uh, a six-pack of, of CF-18 Hornets, uh, as well as an air-to-air -air refueler, uh, very various other air assets uh, and various support personnel uh, as well. Uh, and Canadian forces in that operation conducted about 10 percent of total strike operations uh, that, that were conducted by uh, the operation. So uh, a significant, albeit not irrepla irreplaceable, national contribution uh, to, a, to a larger multinational effort led uh, by a Canadian. There are two main bodies of law that are applicable to this operation. And the, the first governs resort to force the decisions that states make to, to go to war in the first place. Uh, and in particular, the general legal prohibitions that one finds in the United Nations Charter and in customary law uh, against states using force uh, uh, against other states. Uh, and then there's a separate body of law that I'll also briefly discuss, which governs the actual conduct of resulting hostilities, that is the law of armed conflict in particular, uh, that applies regardless of the legality of the initial state decision to go to war. And looking at both of those frameworks, there are a number of legal lessons that one might draw from uh, the intervention in Libya. First and foremost among those is the benefit of having an express UN authorization to engage in military action in another state. The use of force is generally prohibited uh, at international law, uh, but there are exceptions to that general prohibition, and one of those involves actions authorized by the UN Security Council pursuant to its authority under Chapter 7 of the Charter of the United Nations. There is no question that that authority existed for uh, international involvement in Libya in 2011. Resolution 1973 from the Security Council authorized all necessary measures, which is UN Security Council code for up to and including the use of force, uh, to protect civilians and civilian populated areas under threat of attack uh, in Libya, with particular reference then to the city of Benghazi. And so long as NATO intervention stayed within that Security Council mandate, there was then no violation of this larger overarching legal regime and therefore no responsibility, importantly, for individual NATO member states to rebuild Libya. Uh, to contribute to, uh, to post-conflict reconstruction and other obligations that conceivably could apply uh, in the event that the, the operation wasn't authorized and was found to be unlawful. So a significant uh, benefit uh, in, from a legal context is that express authorization provided by the Security Council. One of the other significant benefits of that mandate was the fact that it was open-ended. There was no end date established in the Security Council resolution itself, no artificial threshold uh, imposed on operations, uh, which was very helpful as this operation ultimately extended to a full seven months, which was much longer than was anticipated. And the more controversial it became, uh, the more difficult it probably would have been to achieve uh, a subsequent security Security Council mandate to extend uh, a time-limited uh, initial mandate. So having that open-ended authorization at the start was quite important. Uh, and the authorization allowed for uh, flexible objectives in the military operation itself. It effectively allowed the tailoring of the mission as the situation on the ground changed, uh, as uh, NATO and the intervening states understood the threats to uh, Libyan civilians differently. 
Clearly, the mandate was first and foremost directed against the actions of the Libyan government. Uh, that's where the discussion in the Security Council focused prior to the, the resolution. That's what the sanctions regime that was also imposed by the Security Council focused on. Uh, and uh, it, it was all regime figures that were targeted with the individual targeted sanctions imposed by the Security Council. Uh, and there's no question that that mandate permitted the targeting of regime military forces uh, that uh, were seen as posing a threat to Libyan civilians. The ultimate uh, end of that operation was uh, the overthrow of the Libyan regime by the domestic rebel forces under the TNC banner. Uh, but there's no question that NATO involvement uh, against those regime forces uh, facilitated that domestic end uh, achieved by the, the, the rebel forces themselves. Now that result is not inconsistent with, nor was it prohibited by, the UN Security Council mandate, uh, which was general uh, and focused solely on the, the protection of, of Libyan uh, civilians. So long as that end result that is contributing to operations that ultimately led to the domestic overthrow of the government, so long as those NATO actions were seen as uh, necessary to fulfill the protection mandate, there's nothing inconsistent with that end result. Uh, and the mandate. Uh, that said, uh, one of the further lessons that one might draw from Unified Protector uh, was uh, the potential risk inherent in uh, ambiguity in a Security Council mandated uh, mission. While the mandate clearly supported NATO's interpretation of the mandate, it also nonetheless uh, gave way to or allowed for significant criticism of NATO action by other states, including including two permanent members, Russia and China, uh, who had abstained in the initial authorization to use force, uh, and South Africa and others who argued that uh, NATO's actions extended beyond pure protection uh, into uh, actual regime change. Those are difficult to support on the face of the resolution, uh, but they continue, uh, and greater, greater clarity uh, in the mandate provided by the Security Council certainly would have been beneficial to Canada and other states intervening if that was uh, what the result of the operation was going to be. Uh, assuming, of course, that greater clarity would have allowed for uh, a fairly extensive use of force. Right? One of the benefits of ambiguity, as you saw in Resolution 1973, was that all parties in the Security Council and subsequent other parties uh, could walk away with their own legitimate, reasonable interpretations of, uh, of the same language. Uh, that's often the price of Security Council authorizations, not only in this context. Uh, it doesn't uh, make it less lawful uh, to, in, uh, to, to interpret it in one particular way, but it does raise legitimacy questions because it opens the door for counter-arguments. Uh, one of the further lessons that one might draw extending beyond the initial mandate uh, is the involvement concurrently of the International Criminal Court uh, in reviewing actions that took place in Libya after February of 2011. That too was authorized by the UN Security Council in Resolution 1970, uh, sorry, Resolution 1970, uh, prior to the, the authorization to actually use force. Uh, and that was necessary because Libya itself isn't a party to the UN, uh, to the statute of the International Criminal Court. Uh, and so the court would have otherwise had no jurisdiction jurisdiction over those actors uh, apart from uh, the Security Council mandate. Uh and that resulted, that ICC involvement resulted in uh, arrest warrants for uh, Gaddafi, the, the leader, uh, de facto at least, of, of Libya, uh, his son Saif, uh, and the military intelligence chief of Libya at the time, Abdullah al Sanusi. That mandate and the, the subsequent uh, arrest warrants issued by the ICC were very useful for the delegitimation of that regime by intervening forces. Uh, when you're engaged in an operation, against another party that is seen by the International Criminal Court, uh, at least by the Office of the Prosecutor at that point, as engaging in crimes against humanity, uh, that can provide quite extensive uh, legitimacy to, to your uh, operations at the same time. Uh, now, I should note that 
ICC jurisdiction actually did already exist and continues to exist over the Canadian forces and over Canadians themselves by virtue of Canada's status uh, as a party to this treaty. So it was possible not just for the ICC to issue arrest warrants for, uh, for Libyan actors, uh, but it could conceivably also have been possible for the courts to investigate uh, and issue arrest warrants for Canadians uh, and for many of the other intervening forces, albeit not Americans and others from non-states parties, uh, should their actions have been seen as, uh, as war crimes. Uh, that didn't happen, uh, but and that sort of oversight for law-abiding actors is not uh, necessarily a negative. Uh, but it is a factor that one needs to consider for future Canadian operations because that sort of international court oversight is always going to be there uh, for Canada and for other states that are parties to the Rome Statute, uh, assuming that Canada doesn't subsequently withdraw from that treaty and it, it's unlikely to, to do so. Uh, the, the, I guess in the, the time remaining, I'll jump to the, how these lessons apply to uh, in the context of ongoing operations in uh, both Iraq and Syria. You know, what implications do, do, does this have for Canada and what lessons can we draw? Uh, first, there's there's no legal issue with respect to Canadian involvement in Iraq, uh, the first initial part of Operation Impact. Uh, the general prohibition on the use of force in international relations isn't implicated at all uh, with that operation because Canadian and other forces are there in support of the government of Iraq and at the request of the government of Iraq. Uh, so long as they comply with the law of armed conflict in conducting their operations, uh, there's no international legal concern. There, Where things get interesting uh, is in relation to various state involvement in Syria, uh, where you've got a very legally complex situation with various conflicts and various commingling of players. Uh, there's a non-international armed conflict between Syria and the Islamic State uh, and with other rebel groups uh, in Syria as well. There's probably a conflict between some of those armed groups. Uh, there's a conflict conflict involving Turkey uh, and the Kurds, uh, and there's uh, the, the Canadian and other uh, intervention uh, as well uh, against the Islamic State. Um, there's no Security Council mandate for action for military actions uh, in Iraq at this point, or sorry, in uh, in Syria at this point, uh, largely as a result of the threat of the veto, if not the the exercise thereof, primarily from Russia. Although conceivably in future, there's also the risk of U.S. veto uh, with respect to Russian and other uh, actors engaged there. Although again, they don't need. Uh, Security Council authorization. I mean, I'll flag as an aside uh, that the states with the strongest legal argument right now in Syria are Russia and Iran, uh, which are there operating in support of what is still the, the lawful government of that state, as odious as it might be. Um, in contrast, the United States, Saudis, there are other states uh, that were or are still providing arms and support to rebel forces. If those are targeting the government in particular, uh, there is a very interesting legal situation that may well give rise to a violation of, of the prohibition on the use of force. Uh, now, neither of those arguments is absolute. I mean, there are concerns about uh, certainly Russian conduct uh, and some of the basis for intervention given the, the state of, of the government and its control over territory. There are some legal arguments for the U.S. and others, but, but they're, they're, they're not terribly strong. Uh, Canada is also not operating in Iraq, or sorry, in Syria with the consent of the government, at, at least that we know of. Uh, there's no requirement that consent be given publicly, uh, but, but publicly there has been no consent given. Uh, but the air campaign is also not fighting the government of Syria. Uh, it's directed instead, instead against enemies of that government. So that said, on, the, on its face, it's still a violation of the prohibition on the use of force uh, in international relations, uh, prima facie. Uh, but 
Formally, it's been justified on the basis of self-defense. There's, there's no Security Council mandate, but it's been justified on the other, the only other uh, exception to the general prohibition on the use of force, and that's self-defense. Primarily, the self-defense of Iraq uh, in uh, and against non-state actors operating from Syria, uh, with the, the also the invocation of, of national self-defense for Canada uh, as a sec second ground. Um, now. That's not, in, in the traditional context of the, the uh, legal regime governing self-defense, uh, that's, it, it's not, uh, um, it's a controversial argument. Uh, traditionally, self-defense applied against state actors, and that's not what we have here. Uh, the argument is instead that, that Syria is unable or unwilling to, to effectively address ISIS, and so other states need to. There's a basis for that, but it's, there's also opposition to that legal argument as well. And the absence of Security Council authority is, uh, makes those arguments much more challenging. It's, it's more difficult to support, and therefore there's, there's greater legal risk. Now, I don't, I don't want to suggest that, that there's illegality, uh, but the absence of an express mandate makes arguments against it stronger. Uh, and instead, the argument in favor of it more difficult to sustain. Now, the risks of that are mitigated quite substantially by virtue of the actual opponent and the context in the ground. Uh, there's no international support, really, to speak of for, for ISIS. Uh, and intervention is effectively, indirectly, if not directly, benefiting the Syrian state. Uh, so the odds of a legal claim against any intervening state are incredibly slim. Uh, and I'm not going to suggest that, that any such claim would necessarily be successful even if it was raised. But there are other more subtle, subtle implications that one might draw uh, from this in comparison to Libya, where the, the less obvious legal base uh, means you're likely to have less in broad base international support uh, for intervention. And that translates into a higher burden borne by those states that are intervening, uh, both in blood and in treasure, more, more so than, uh, than, than blood in this case. Uh, and that raises some um, international domestic legitimacy concerns. But again, uh, you know, as a final comment, uh, all the interventions are different, uh, but the stronger the mandate can be, uh, the easier it's going to be uh, to gain uh, allies and to uh, gain legitimacy. Uh, and that's perhaps the greatest takeaway from, uh, from Libya, and I'll, I'll stop at that. Thanks. Thank you. Hey. Was a, um, should we applaud? Yes. Let's applaud. That was, uh, thank you for the, uh, it was very clear analysis walking us through those considerations. Um, I'm happy to now introduce our next speaker, Gaël Rivard Pichet, who is a PhD candidate here at NIPSIA. And uh, her dissertation looks at how security sector reform affects the production of public order and ultimately violence in post conflict countries and fragile states. And her field research is focused on Haiti and El Salvador. If I understood correctly, um, as we were standing in the food line, you wrote this chapter as you were leaving Haiti. The chapter is entitled uh, Securing the Pearl of the Caribbean, the Canadian Contribution to Haiti's Security and Stability, 2004-2014. And the, the only other thing I would point out is that she just last year spent a year as a Fulbright Research Fellow in the International Security uh, Program at the Belfer Center at Harvard. So over to you. Great. Thank you. Uh Roland, and I first want to thank um, Professor Seidman and Professor Hampson to actually invite, uh, for having invited me to join this project. It was really great to be able, as a young scholar and a young researcher, to put my own research uh, into the Canadian foreign policy lens and to be able to see how relevant something very theoretical and, same, and at the same time something very practical based on field research could be analyzed from this perspective. Also, I would like to underline that uh, this project um, is um, is a collective endeavor that brought together the, um, six women. So we have a full gender parity, and I think it's really important to uh, note because uh, we tend to see uh, all men panel and all men projects, and in that case, uh, the, the leaders really took the time to make sure that women would be represented, and I think uh, we can see how, how much uh, of uh, great research is done by uh, women on Canadian foreign policy. 
So as it was uh, just said, I wrote this chapter. I was coming back from Haiti from three months, actually, doing field research on not only the reform of the Haitian National Police, but also violence in general uh, in Haiti and the evolution since 2004, uh, since the intervention of the United Nations. And I really looked at Canada because actually Canada is playing a very uh, important role through the UN. We have right now a police contingent of 100 police officers. It's the biggest uh, national contingent within the mission, as well as a small uh, military operation called the Operation Amlet that is contributing to uh, the military uh, headquarters of MINUSTA. As well, you have Canadian uh, in position, in key position within uh, the mission. So, for example, the rule of law office is directed by a Canadian as well as the uh, police unit. So, a lot of people are actually saying that MINUSTA is almost Canadian. And actually, Canada has really been a key contributor to Haiti's stabilization and reconstruction over the last 25 years. Actually, for every mission uh, the UN has deployed in Haiti since 1993, we've seen uh, Canadian contributing uh, through uh, military uh, troops or police uh, officers. We also contributed to Haiti's development and uh, stabilization through uh, bilateral programs, uh, through, for example, Canadem, which would deploy deployed police officers uh, outside of the UN channels and electoral missions that were deployed uh, during periods of transition or during periods of crisis. And in 2004, after the forced departure of Jean-Bertrand Aristide, the president of Haiti at the time, the United Security Council and the United Nations Security Council deployed the MINUSTA, so the UN uh, mission for the stabilization of Haiti, uh, in which uh, Canadians were contributing, as I said earlier. And that was authorized under the uh, government of Paul Martin at the time, who really saw the uh, Canadian contribution as being part of the whole of government approach that had been first developed for Afghanistan, uh, as it is discussed in one of the chapter in the book. And even though the government changed and we saw the conservative com uh, came into power, we, uh, Haiti remained officially a priority for the government. And up until 2011, there was really uh, important investment made in Haiti through the minister, but also through the um, uh, quick impact project that were uh, done under uh, the START program at DFAT-D or DFAT at that time. In 2010, uh, Haiti was uh, struck by a really uh, important earthquake that killed more than 200,000 uh, people in Haiti. And uh, Canada was there to respond. Humanitarian assistance was provided by the government and uh, in addition to the contribution that was made through the uh, UN uh, mission. However, what we see from 2011, and this is where it becomes extremely interesting, is that even though we're investing a lot of resources in responding to the humanitarian crisis that have been caused by the earthquake, we see a decline in regular Canadian assistance and leadership uh, in Haiti. And this is explained by several factors. There was some changes at home in the way aid was uh, directed, change in priorities. A change in minister in 2012 with the arrival of Julian Fantino as Minister of International Development uh, put uh, a stop to uh, international aid to Haiti uh, because there, he called for a review of aid effectiveness. At the same time, he was extremely critical of the lack of uh, progress in Haiti, uh, commenting on the garbage and the fact that a lot of the uh, buildings have not yet been rebuilt in Port-au-Prince, the uh, Haitian capital. And start the program for quick impact projects also stopped being funded. So the Canadian embassy ended up in a position where they didn't have any more money to engage bilaterally uh, with uh, the Haitian government and Haitian local pa partners. And there was also a lack of strategy. There was no renewal of the strategy towards Haiti. For, so for four years, you had officials in the embassy that had no strategy to follow and were building up on priorities that had been established before the earthquake. Nonetheless, as I said before, the importance of Canada remain, uh, remain in Haiti through MINUSTA, but there was really, when I was there, uh, some important questions coming from uh, Haitians official, but also local partners about the role of Haiti and it's, uh, the role of Canada in Haiti. 
the election of Justin Trudeau uh, two weeks ago and the uh, new liberal government that will uh, that will uh, come into uh, into Parliament are very soon really gives us the opportunity to redefine uh, Canada's role uh, in, in Haiti. This is also the case because in Haiti right now uh, they are going, uh, they are in an electoral ca uh, period and we just had the first uh, round of the presidential election that will bring into power someone new on which we can uh, build a new partnership, try to establish new priority and try to establish a new strategy uh, to uh, support Haiti's in, a, Haiti's in its development. But I really think that Canada should renew its engagement to Haiti and I also for three main reasons. First of all, it's an easy sell at home. Uh, Haiti is one of those places where we intervene, where it's easy for Canada to actually build onto this image of the blue element country, the, con the country that will contribute peacefully to alleviate poverty and suffering. It's the place that is easy to sell to the population, especially since we have a big dias a Haitian diaspora in Montreal, uh, and that we've been there for several years, and it seems very p positively. Secondly, Haiti is a place where actually Canada can make a difference to contribute to uh, regional security, North America security, and uh, fulfill its mandate in terms of hemispheric uh, defense. It's also, Haiti is a place where we can invest in our partnership with the United States. The WikiLeaks have revealed that the United States is extremely happy to see Canada taking a leadership role because they don't have to do it in Haiti. So it's a way where we're doing both both we're contributing to the security of North America and investing in our main partnership. And finally, going to Haiti and investing in Haiti development is a way to show to the international community that Canada is actually ready for business, is ready to take its role as leader of multilateral um, initiatives once more with this new government. However, if Canada is to renew its engagement to, towards Haiti, it should be done based on the lesson we have already learned from the 25 years which is spent there investing in the security sector. We need to do more, we need to reinvest, but we also need to do better in Haiti. First of all, we have to realize that technical assistance, no matter how good it is, is not enough to actually ensure the sustainability of the development process in Haiti. We have been engaging with the Haitian National Police for now 10 years, training police officers, building police stations, and providing them with material. However, this is great, but the police is still not able to provide security to the entire country or to actually um, <clears throat> Is not doesn't have the capacity because there's not a real recognition that reforming the Haitian National Police is a political process that needs to involve the Haitian government. If we don't have a real leadership from the government, there is no way, no matter how good the police officers are, no matter how beautiful those police stations are, there is no way that the police will be able to do its job and do it in a sustainable manner. Therefore, Canadian actors need to be aware that uh, they need to engage with uh, the Haitian government in this process and to see the reform of the Haitian National Police as a political process. We also need to invest beyond state institutions. As I said earlier, uh, Haiti is not yet able to provide services to the entire population and we need to engage with local actors who are actually providing de facto services to the population. We need to find ways through partners, local and international partners to engage with those actors and develop, develop a more coherent approach to security uh, in Haiti. Secondly, we need to realize that fluctuation in funding can really hurt our partner and the local population. From 2007, uh, Canada funded a Brazilian NGO in Bel Air uh, in the ghetto of Boro Plants. Uh, Viva, uh, an NGO, Viva, Viva Rio is a, local, is a Brazilian NGO that is involved in violence reduction and peace building. And the money was mostly used to fund employments in uh, the uh, project led by Viva Rio. After an audit that was conducted in 2009, Start decided to stop funding uh, those initiatives. And, and this happened exactly at the same time in the direct aftermath of the earthquake. What it 
created was in a situation that was already very unstable because of the earthquake. The few employment position that were still available disappeared and it created a lot of tension in the community. Vivario actually had to close its main installation in the neighborhood for more than six months and Minusta and Canada, because Minusta was also a partner of Vivario, lost a way to engage with the local population in Bela. Finally, and I think it's really, and it comes from those first recommendations, Canada needs to uh, develop a long-term and coherent strategy with, uh, towards Haiti with, the, with all our partners, MINUSTA, or the, the mission that will follow after MINUSTA, or uh, the Haitian government and local partners. It's a long-term process. Uh, in 2009, I interviewed police officers who had been in Haiti between 2004 and 2008, and I would ask them, how long do you think we need to be in Haiti uh, to, be, to ensure the sustainability of the reform process? And it would tell me 10 to 15 years. Last year, while I was in Haiti, I interviewed more police officers, and I asked them the same question five years later, and the answer was exactly the same, 10 to 15 years. So the point is not how many years do we need, but the fact that it's a long-term process, and that thinking that we can evaluate success based on investment made over five or 10 years won't cut it. It's a, and we need to commit uh, not only based on year, but more based on uh, long-term objective. It's also about the fact that uh, Haiti is not only, the investment in Haiti is not only about stability, it's also about sustainability. When uh, Canada first invested in Haiti in the creation of the police in 1995 uh, through um, the uh, United Nations mission that was in place at that time, they, uh, the whole uh, operation withdrew in 2000, five years after the beginning of the investment. More than four, year, less than four years later, we needed a new mission, a new intervention, stronger, with more power and more military strength to be able to stabilize the, the country. So the lesson is that even though you're doing a really good job, if you do it too quickly based on uh, security priority and stability uh, imperative, you won't be there won't, it won't be sustainable. So it's really about seeing how we can stabilize the country, but also contribute to the sustainability of the development process. So in conclusion, I think that we need to do more and to do it better, and we really need to learn from our experience. We've been there 25 years. We need to build on that knowledge, and we need to recognize where we made mistakes and what were the places where we actually did a good job and continue to work uh, on these uh, objectives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that excellent presentation. Um, sounds like a very important product, uh, project to be able to identify those areas um, where there is learning um, possible and necessary. Um, and the issue of timelines, of course, is interesting, as you were pointing out the anecdote of hearing six to, what was it, five to 10 years, and then you came back later, and it was still five to 10 years. It's a serious issue, but on a lighter note, it reminds me of, uh, I think it was Madagascar, too, when the penguins say that it's going to take six to eight months to fix the plane. And somebody says, 68 months? In any event, um, long. Uh, so we'll turn now to our third presenter, um, my uh, University of Ottawa colleague, Stephen Brown, who's a uh, professor of political science. Uh, he, between 2013 and 15, was a senior fellow at the Center for Global Cooperation Research, and I'm going to butcher the name here, at the University of Duisburg Essen. Thank you, Germany. And he's a he is a prolific um, scholar and author uh, with works on foreign aid and African politics and democratization, and um, very much um, like the other presenters here. Um, straddles the uh, academic space and uh, being able to um, uh, do uh, policy analysis as well. Uh, his, uh, he's the editor of a book called Struggling for Effectiveness, CETA and Canadian Foreign Aid in 2012, co-editor of Rethinking Canadian Aid 2014, and um, this year the securitization of foreign aid. Maybe we need another Rethinking Foreign Aid book uh, starting right now. All right. Over to you, Stephen. I'm going to speak for here because I have a PowerPoint. It's a very simple PowerPoint. 
Um, we're actually working on a second edition of Rethinking Canadian Aid, um, hopefully coming out um, in May 2016. So does this show up well? Okay. So um, let me say a few words about the genesis of this chapter. From at least my perspective, it began at ISA, the International Studies Association Conference in Toronto, where I was looking for a bagel. It was in the basement of the Sheraton Hotel, and I'm walking around sort of wondering where the bagels are, because it was early in the morning and I was hungry, and I hear somebody shout my name. So I look around, and there's Steve Sademan. And he calls me over and he says, I'm editing Canada by Nations. Do you want to contribute a chapter on foreign aid? And I said, of course, because I wouldn't say no to that. And um, I'd like to think that he didn't just ask me because he happened to see me looking for a bagel that he would have asked me anyway. But to confirm that, you'll need to ask him. Um, later on, I was told that the theme of this book was interventions and that I was given the brief to talk about development interventions. And that had me scratching my head because I didn't know what development interventions are, because there isn't really such a term. So I chose to interpret it as foreign aid. And um, the next puzzle then was how do I write about 15 years of foreign aid from Canada to over 100 countries covering all sectors from, I don't know, humanitarian assistance to capacity building to food aid to everything. So what I decided to do, and, and, and in 5,500 words, I think it was our limit. So what I decided to do was to focus on motives and to derive from the emphasized motives some um, assessments about effectiveness. So it's not an assessment of aid to all these countries across all these sectors. I think I only re read one evaluation report that I'll mention very briefly. Um, but I looked at the way can can the Canadian government expressed or showed its motive for foreign aid. And the way it's usually described is that it's broken down into two or three possible categories. Uh, when it's two, it's altruism, so doing thing for the things for the benefit of others, versus uh, self-interest, so doing things for Canada's benefit. Sometimes the second one gets broken down into two subcategories, political self-interest and commercial self-interest. But usually it's really on, only those three possible motivations. And they're really limits to, to the analysis that, that, that focuses only on that. And what I decided to do was to take um, a framework from Maurits van der Veen from a book called Ideas, Interests, and Foreign Aid, in which he has seven frames, what he calls frames, or we could call rationales for foreign aid. And to, to apply each one to Canadian aid over the past 15 years and to see to what extent uh, these frames characterized Canadian aid or various governments, so the, the latter years of the Keatsang government, the Martin government, and then the Harper government. So one of the things I did was I represented them visually, as you can see here. Um, these are the seven frames. On the left-hand side are the ones that are more self-interested. On the right-hand side, the ones that are more altruistic. On the top are the ones that are more material. Um, and the, the, at the bottom are the ones that are more on the ideational level, that are more about ideas. So let me just go through them very, very quickly. The first frame that he lists, this is in his order, it's no special order, is security. So we do things because it, it's better for security of Canadians. Second one is for power and influence. So things like at the G8, being able to announce things um, like focus on Africa or focus on maternal health. The third one is economic self-interest, which is pretty easy to understand. The fourth one is enlightened self-interest, things like global warming or world peace that might be in our self-interest, but it's also a global public good. The fifth one is self-affirmation and reputation, so things like being able to claim global leadership. The sixth one is obligation and duty. And in foreign aid, there aren't very many obligations. What there is, though, um, one of the most important things is an agreed target for levels of foreign aid which is 0.7% of gross national income. And so as part of this chapter, I prepared a little chart that shows this percentage um, over a 40-year period. Uh, so Canada, like other developed countries, committed in, in 1970 to reach the target of 0.7 in 1975. So 0 0.7 is at the top of the chart. It's the top line. As you can see, we never came all that close, but 
I have no idea how visible that is to you, but basically we were not doing too badly uh, throughout the 80s, somewhere between 0.4 and 0.55, but then actually under the Kretsinger government, Canadian foreign aid plummeted and kept falling until 2001. And that's where we really hit our low point. Um, after that, it, it started to increase, and then uh, even more under the Harper government in the early years. But starting in 2011, it, it dropped again, and uh, last year was at only 0.24%, so um, just a bit over a third of the target. And um, Canada's now officially, under the Harper government, officially abandoned that target. So Kate even while he was cutting it drastically, uh, would reaffirm Canada's commitment to this target, but now we've abandoned it. Anyway, that's my aside on obligation and duty, because as I said, there aren't too many legal obligations in foreign aid. Um, and then the, the seventh frame is humanitarianism, which most closely corresponds to altruism in the, in the typical way of organizing things. So what I'm going to do today, just to keep things to 15 minutes, um, is to focus mostly on the Harper government. Uh, in the chapter, I talk more about how the frames, how, how the Keitsen and Martin frames have, how the, how the frames changed and were used um, during the liberal governments as well, um, and how, they, how the liberals were much more ideational than the conservative government, which focuses almost solely on material goals. But uh, let me just talk about the three dominant frames. So the, number one, not in any particular order, but the first one I'm going to talk about is security. And you can see, understandably, after 9-11, there is a, an increase in the use of security in Canada and other countries uh, for, as a justification for foreign aid. And you can see it very strongly, in fact, in the Martin government's international policy statement that constantly said that poverty causes terrorism, terrorism is a threat for us, therefore we have to fight poverty. Um, the security m rationale was also very important for Canada's involvement in Afghanistan, which started earlier but uh, reached its apogee under the Harper government. In 2007, in fact, Afghanistan was receiving 11% of Canadian bilateral aid. So 11% of aid designated to other countries just went to one country. Uh, in fact, there was a vice president of CEDA, the Canadian International Development Agency, only for Afghanistan. This had never happened before. Um, after, though, there was a decline in Canada's involvement in Afghanistan, both kinds of interventions, I mean, military intervention and uh, development intervention, quotation marks, and it's not a coincidence that those go together. Now, in general, security-related foreign aid is not very f effective. Um, it's not very effective at promoting security, but I would set that aside. Um, but it's certainly not very effective in uh, promoting development. And this is something that was recognized even in the DFAT-D uh, evaluation on Canada's aid program in Afghanistan. And it, it's, you can understand that there would be huge pressure on the evaluators to have a positive spin on the billions of dollars spent in Afghanistan. Um, but when they talked about development results, um, especially in Kandahar, they noted, quote, short-term implementation strategies failed to ensure sustainable long-term development results. And this wasn't very surprising to anybody who knows about development and what makes for effective development, but it was interesting to see that even the official evaluation would say that. So we've seen, as I, I said, a decline in the security rationale, but we've seen a, a concomitant growth in the, the economic self-interest rationale. So um, first, let me just point out that there has been one uncontrovertible uh, element of progress in terms of, um, of economic self-interest, self and that's the elimination of tied aid. So 0% of aid now needs to be spent in Canada on Canadian goods and services. This is something that was begun in, uh, by the Keatsang government, but uh, finalized by the Harper government, and that is a great thing. In other things, though, we've seen a huge rise in the use of the economic self-interest rationale. Um, yeah, I had mentioned Julian Fantino. He would say things in interviews with the Globe and Mail, for instance, that Canadians are entitled to benefit from Canadian foreign aid. Um, 
there are many other examples one could give. Um, also, for instance, af soon after the merger of CETA with Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, the new DFAT-D released a Global Actions Market Plan. Part of the idea of the merger, or at least the public justification for the merger, was that there would be greater synergy between these various parts. And the Global Markets Action Plan is, in fact, the only pseudo-white paper that's come out since the merger. And so it's interesting to see to what extent are development interests represented in the document. I could only find one sentence. And the sentence is about seeking to, quote, entrench the concept of economic di diplomacy as the driving force behind, oh, no, I have copied the wrong quote. Sorry. Uh, ignore that quote. Um, I have to paraphrase. The paraphrase, therefore, is um, <coughs> the, the, the quote is something along the lines of using leveraging uh, Canada's development programming to advance Canadian economic interests. That is the only mention of foreign aid in this entire document. So to me, that's very clear, a clear indication of the government's desire to, um, to, to subvert development goals to economic self-interest in Canada. We see it also in the focus in, um, on the extractive sector to the benefit of Canadian mining companies especially. We see it in new partnerships with the promotion of, um, with the selection of countries of focus that just happen to be rich in natural resources. So countries were added to the list of um, Canada's priority recipients of foreign aid in 2009 and in 2014. And we see countries like Myanmar, Democ Democratic Republic of Congo, and uh, Mongolia, and other countries that are of, of particular interest to Canadian mining companies. And that's part of a much larger um, pattern. What I would extrapolate from this is that there is reduced effectiveness of po in poverty reduction. Because though one can argue that um, there is a possible win-win here, that what's good for Canadian, the pri Canadian private sector might also be good for developing companies, uh, countries, Freudian slip. Um, the, the, um, the, the case for that is, is actually a pretty weak one because though the private sector might be the vehicle for reducing poverty, uh, it should be poverty, even by Canadian law, must remain the, remain the primary focus. And very often we get the sense that it is not. Um, let me get to the third frame that is important under the, the Harper regime. And part of this was a surprise to me. Um, so humanitarianism actually has played a very important part in many of the Harper government's um, statements and, and uh, priority programs in foreign aid. Um, here's the surprising part, at least to me, that if you compare the first eight years of the Harper government with the last eight years of the previous liberal governments, uh, the, the proportion of, of bilateral aid that went to the poorest countries, to the least developed countries, actually rose from 16 to 26 percent. And the, um, the proportion of aid in humanitarian assistance went from 7 percent to 12 percent. Does this mean, though, that aid is better? And here I would refer to you to another chapter in the book by Aisha Ahmed, which is on food aid which makes a very strong case how even when things are pitched in a humanitarian way, it doesn't mean that that's actually effective or, or better aid. Um, a lot of this, also one can interpret it, is as um, a way of giving a, a, a sort of a shinier, happier spin to the, the conservatives' aid policy, and I think maternal, newborn, and child health and the Muskoka Initiative are very strong indications of that, of sort of a feel-good motherhood issue. Um, that brings me, I guess, to, to the, 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 the last frame, which is sort of a surprise frame, because it's not part of what you see here. It's not part of Van Der Veen's um, seven frames. But I'd call it a hidden frame, or you could even call it a master frame for so much of what the Canadian government does, especially under the Harper government, but previous governments as well, as well which is focusing on domestic politics, or more specifically, electoral considerations. So if you look at practices around maternal, newborn, and child health, for instance, uh, forbidding any of the funds to support uh, safe, legal abortions anywhere in the world, even if it's legal there. Um, the, the comparative neglect of contraception, 
uh, as part of maternal health, and uh, there's very strong scientific evidence that if you want to save women's lives and um, access to contraception and abortion are very important. So the neglect of that for political reasons. The use of, of what's overall a charity-based approach to poverty, uh, which is they're poor people, we're going to give them blankets, we're going to help them, we're going to save them. Often the word saving comes in. Uh, so the idea of treating symptoms and not going to root causes, not looking at transforming power relationships, but just al alleviating suffering where it exists. So basically band-aids. Um, we can also see the electoral considerations in the fact that the Ukraine has always been a country of focus for as long as Canada has had countries of focus, and that's basically because of the Ukrainian diaspora in Canada and the electoral votes associated with that. Let me conclude, since I'm almost uh, out of time, um, and do a little bit what the others have done and, and talk a bit about what this means for the new government. Um, obviously, it's not in our chapter. Our chapters were finalized a long time ago. We didn't know what the results of the elections will be. But what, I would, what I've seen so far, and I've been paying attention to, to what the Liberals have been saying about their plans for the foreign aid program, they haven't said very much. They have said, though, um, very explicitly that they would return to the best practices in maternal, newborn, and child health. So that means contraception and abortion where legal that they would take action on climate change and re-engage with the world. So that would be re-emphasizing the enlightened self-interest frame, um, working with the, the UN, et cetera. Interestingly, they have not said a word about increasing the aid budget, even though it's been cut now by more than a billion dollars a year. The Liberals have not said anything about increasing it. So that's something that we'll need to keep a close watch on. All right, thank you. Great, thank you. That was excellent. You uh, you managed to cover a lot of ground there, and it was nicely uh, structured, uh, beginning, middle, and end with the uh, right up to today. There's plenty for us to talk about. Three um, interesting presentations, and I want to turn now to uh, the question period. Um, <clears throat> if I could, uh, if anybody has a question they want to ask any of our participants, come to the microphone. It's probably the best bet. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'd like to uh, address uh, my comment to or question to the the Haiti uh, study. Uh, for many years, I was responsible for um, uh, military cooperation in the Defense Department and did capacity building. And a lot of what you say, in fact, everything what you say echoes with my experiences. The one that I was not able to crack, and I don't think you've addressed it, but I'm wondering if you came across it, is that in doing capacity building and doing the long term, because you've got to do a number of things, but after you've built the schools, done the education, did all the soft and hardware stuff, there's one thing that I could never crack, which was sustainability of funding for that institution. Because you're still in a third world environment or a developing country environment. So even though we've come in, we've done the capacity building, all, then you, you, you still can't walk away because someone's got to fund that. And the country itself can't do it because it's a developing country. And that's, I never was able to crack that. Did you ever come across that in your studies? <laughs> In fact, it's something that I'm questioning from the beginning. Maybe the institutions we're building are not sustainable. We're not building, it's, we're, we don't have the right solution. We need to rethink the solution that we're actually proposing to those countries. And we need to see what's already on the ground and how we can work with the structures that are there to actually build something that will be sustainable. It's probably not gonna be optimal from our perspective, but I think that doing it that way will probably be more sustainable. And that means in terms of security, not only thinking that you can train a police and then deploy them and that everything's going to be fine, but to actually look at local mechanism and try to see how you can engage them and maybe find incentive to bring them back in, bring them in a, st a structure that will be acceptable for, for the local population as well as for the interveners and the national government. Not saying it's going to be easy, but I think we need to rethink the initial solution that we're proposing. Um, yeah, and Stephen was talking about Afghanistan, and there's, uh, and I see NEPA in the room too. <clears throat> the issue of the sustainability of development investments in Afghanistan was obviously a, a major issue of discussion as well. Other questions? 
perhaps I'll ask a question then. Uh, question to Chris. I, I'd like to ask you just about, to for you to take your analysis just one step further about the um, international legal basis for uh, intervention in Syria. And um, I'm talking about, you know, the United States as opposed to uh, Iran or Russia here, because obviously the, the legal basis is different, as you very clearly explained in your presentation. So it seem, you seem to be implying your presentation that this is a blurry area uh, potentially, and that um, that it's not a conventional way in which self-defense has been used as a doctrine. Do you think that new law is being made as a result of this experience? Quite possibly. I think in the U.S. there are two separate. It's, it's Syria is so muddled; it's hard to mm -hmm. separate things out. The U.S. is doing two different things, really. One of them is arming and supporting, or at least was, uh, rebel forces. Now, my understanding is that is also directed solely against the fight uh, against ISIS, or solely towards the fight against ISIS. To, to that extent, I guess you can merge them uh, with, with the, the larger air campaign uh, as well. Uh, and I mean, clearly it is non-traditional in the sense that it is uh, not against a state actor. It's across a state border, uh, but not against the government of that state. Uh, and the traditional legal basis for invoking the right of self-defense was clearly tied to an attack, or the presumption behind it was an attack by state actors. Um, I'm, th this is contributing to an emerging trend. I'm not sure this is the vanguard of it, but it's, it's close to it, uh, with arguments for intervention in other states where that state proves uh, unwilling or unable. And in this case, the government of Syria is clearly willing to target ISIS. It's just the argument is that it's unable, and its inability is then threatening I mean, there's, an echo, there's even an echo of R2P in there, but in a very different um, context, right? Unwilling and unable. That's right. In it's, that case, it's, to deliver on a responsibility to protect. Uh, and it's, it, it's, I don't think, coincidental that that yeah. language is being used, because mm -hmm. that, that's uh, sort of commonly understood grounds, politically at least, for justifying intervention in, in other areas. I mean, it's not, R2P is not a legal doctrine, uh, whereas self-defense is, but, but that, uh, the, the inability and unwillingness mm -hmm. is, uh, is providing that basis. And that's where it's controversial. I mean, it, it's, again, not the only or the first case where that's been done. Uh, Russia's invoked it in the past. Uh, uh, Uganda has invo mm -hmm. invoked it, uh, and, and there are other examples. Uh, but the more that states do it, and the more that it's states that have uh, some global influence, mm -hmm. uh, the, the more normalized the stronger, it, it Exactly, and the stronger that argument is. And there's nothing... There's nothing inherently unlawful about that. The UN Charter was written 70 years ago, uh, and it was intended to and necessarily has to evolve in interpretation in light of emerging trends. I mean, it wasn't intended to, to, to bind uh, all in eternity to the meaning of the terms in 1945. Mm -hmm. uh, and it will evolve based on state practice uh, and uh, subsequent practice and understanding what the UN Charter permits. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that you're certainly seeing these arguments advanced, uh, and there's a reasonable basis now to, to argue that there is that, that they are law. Mm -hmm. um, the the challenge is that it's not as obvious uh, as a more traditional argument on self-defense, and it's certainly not as obvious as uh, an express Chapter Seven mandate, right. uh, and that comes with risks. Mm -hmm. You know, it, and. Whenever one is on the forefront of potential changes to the law, uh, the risks that result increase mm -hmm. uh, because the presumption is that cross-border use of force is unlawful, mm -hmm. uh, absent a justification. And so the less obvious the justification is, the greater risk you take on yourself. Thank you. Come on up. Come to the microphone. Um, 
I guess, uh, sorry, wow, everyone's taller than me. Okay. Um, not for the first time, certainly not for the last. Um, I guess my question would be for the second and third uh, presenters. Um, I mean, there was a lot of talk about, like, incoherence. Um, there was a talk about, you know, the fact that, like, foreign aid was only mentioned as a uh, way to kind of boost Canadian economic interests abroad. So I'm wondering to the extent that you feel that um, a white paper would be beneficial or useful in perhaps addressing some of the issues that you raise. I don't know, Chris, if you have anything to say about that as well. But I guess it's been about 10 years since we've had a white paper. Um, so what kind of, you mean on all aspects like of Like kind of like a foreign, policy? general foreign policy white paper. And, and um, you know, there's some argument, like, would a white paper, like, bring some better mm -hmm. strategic coherence? You know, uh, the Kretchen government had a white paper that was, you know, very, with three very broad goals. I mean, you could have an argument being, well, those were kind of meaningless. So mm -hmm. I guess, you know, do you think that the new government looking forward, should they be designing a white paper? Should they be like going, going forward? And do you think that would help bring any kind of clarity to the issues that you both raised in your presentation? Who wants to answer? Stephen? Okay. Uh, the answer is definitely yes. Uh, it's sorely needed. There have been um, many studies of, I'm, I'm speaking from the point of view of Canadian development policy. There have been many studies that have invoked the need for this. Um, some of the chapters in the, in the books that Roland mentioned that I edited addresses specifically. The North-South Institute um, has a paper on the need for that. Um, the OECD and its peer reviews of Canada also flags the sorely missing overarching framework or policy, sort of like clarifying what the basic goal is. In 2008, in the minority Harper government, um, a private member's bill proposed by the Liberal Party was passed that, called the Official Development Assistance uh, <coughs> Accountability Act. And it defined poverty reduction as the central um, goal of Canadian foreign aid. And it had three tests so that aid had to um, take it, fight, fight poverty, take into account the perspectives of the poor, and be consistent with Canada's international human rights uh, obligations. And, and it, NGOs and other activists had worked for this legislation for years, and it was hoped that this would provide so, some kind of overarching vision. But it failed miserably, uh, in part because it was weakened in, in order to pass um, the House of Commons. And um, those three tests that I mentioned are preceded by, um, in the opinion of the minister, the you know, aid must, or the aid programs must. So all the minister has to do is say, yeah, I think this would be good for the poor. And then that's, that passes the test. Um, so definitely the new government should have um, some kind of coherent policy statement about foreign aid, what its goal is. We've seen it pulled in so many different directions in recent years. Um, consultations would be really useful. I'm sure lots of NGOs would like to give their input. And then even better would be to insert this within a broader foreign policy vision that, that has coherence and goes beyond just saying, um, you know, foreign aid can be leveraged for other Canadian foreign policy goals. Okay. I also think that uh, the exercise leading to the white paper would be extremely interesting to actually be able to have a, ref a reflection across government and across agencies to try to see what the priorities, what do we want to prioritize, how do we want to do, uh, go about it, and to actually to look at what we've been doing for the last 10, 20 years and what we're good at. Where we should, uh, where we should uh, put, uh, you know, the majority of our resources. Do we want to go broad? Do we want to focus on specific aspects? So I think the reflection exercise, and also it will be a great opportunity for the new government and. Uh, I mean, the government uh, to engage with the research community and NGOs and et cetera to try to see how we can move forward with a new foreign policy. Professor Saidman. To you. Uh, as we have a new government coming to power uh, with an agenda that seems to suggest more interventions on the horizon since they talk a good game of doing peacekeeping operation, I guess one of the things I'm curious about what the panelists might say about two possible imperatives that might shape the way Canada looks at these things. The one is that Canada wants to, do, wants to be engaged in the world to make a difference. 
Uh, so perhaps Canada should decide where it can best make a difference. And so I'm curious as to what your takes are on, on that versus another imperative, which is to do no harm. Uh, because one of the implications of many of the chapters in the volume are we've not contributed to good things, but it may have fostered bad things. And even in talking about aid effectiveness, if aid is utterly ineffective, why bother? Um, so as this volume was uh, in, in a series called Canada Among Nations, this is about Canada in nations. And maybe we have learned uh, some humility as a result of, of the past decade or two of interventions. And maybe we should get out of this business entirely. So I'm curious as to your take on sort of that kind of dark, depressing punchline, even as the sun finally came out today. <laughs> okay, let me begin by utterly rejecting your statement that um, aid is utterly ineffective, so why bother? There is no evidence that aid is utterly ineffective. Nobody says that aid is utterly ineffective except for a few crackpots. There are many studies that um, show that, that aid is modestly effective in things like achieving growth and strengthening institutions. And there's plenty of evidence that aid, aid saves a lot of lives. So aid, um, for instance, uh, vaccinations, um, you know, it's hard to argue that they're doing more harm than good. Uh, that said, your point about doing no harm is an important one, and aid can do harmful things. Um, there have been... Um, Christoph Zercher, Roland's colleague, has written about some important things, some important harm that aid has done in Afghanistan. Others have as well. So um, I would very strongly resist any sort of throwing out of the, the, the baby with the bathwater um, just because some harm can be done in some places under some circumstances to say just throw out the whole thing. There's plenty of evidence. And, and, and I think there's a danger when, when people like me uh, critique aid or critique Canadian foreign aid especially, to give the impression that it's all bad and so on, um, but that is actually very far from the truth. If it were true, I wouldn't be saying things like the volume of age should go up. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll leave it at that. Gal, do you want to intervene here? Yeah, I think, once again, based on what we've been doing, there are some things that we're really good at and that we should be aware of them and we should invest. And in the case of Haiti, we have developed a very specific expertise in terms of police training. We've been deploying more than, more than 100 police officers every year for the last 10 years. And usually, you cannot go back more than once. I think this should be changed. We've created an expertise within our police. We now have Francophone police officers who speak Creole, who can actually go down to Haiti and do real work, that know the field, and are able to actually get effective quickly. With the right training, with the right formation beforehand, they can really make a difference on the ground. And we don't talk a lot about them, but I think this is a place where Canada, with the limit in resources, can actually make a difference in Haiti, but could also transpose its experience to other cases and try to uh, really develop an expertise beyond uh, just one country in that field. Yeah, I, I guess... I'll come at it from the, the frame of military intervention, obviously, but uh, but looking at the, the making a difference and doing no harm, one can tie that back at least to a significant degree to the ability to garner a UN Security Council mandate uh, in many circumstances, right? That, that at least is you've had a less partial or more impartial assessment of uh, whether intervention will make a difference, right? Libya, there was that assessment. Now, now, albeit five of the 15 members of the Security Council abstained from that assessment for, for the, the authorization of military force, but there was at least a broader assessment than NATO alone. Right, that that uh, this would be or could be positive. Uh, now, whether it was is a different discussion, but one of the benefits of having uh, a Security Council mandate is that if harm is done, uh, then the responsibility lies elsewhere, at least as a matter of law. Uh, it's not a Canadian responsibility. It's a UN responsibility uh, or a Libyan responsibility. It's not, it's, it's not a national one. Um, that said, the Security Council doesn't always authorize uh, interventions for various reasons. And that, 
that, though, may be a signal of a potential problem uh, about uh, and perhaps should be a red flag, not necessarily determinative, uh, but a red flag about thinking about whether intervention will make a difference, whether it will do no harm. Uh, and the, the clearest example I can think of there would have been intervention in Syria, not against ISIS, but ag against the Syrian government, uh, which is clearly uh, a, a very problematic regime for many Syrian civilians. Uh, and there was serious talk, uh, well, during the Libyan operation and certainly after that uh, to this day about potential intervention to address that. Uh, the absence of a Security Council mandate, I think, is there an indication of serious problems, and to my mind at least not an indication that the system has failed, but in, in some respects that it has worked. Uh, the, the, the Security Council was designed, decision making was designed to prevent war between the major powers, right? and, and there was a risk of that I intervening in Syria, uh, and so it would have been a red flag, no, no, it should have been taken that way. Uh, and the do no harm issue I think is a significant one there. Uh, Syria is not living there were a lot of folks that said, just impose a no-fly zone, just uh, limit the ability of the government to attack civilians. Well, uh, Syria can fight back uh, in a way that Libya couldn't, and the, the costs of intervening based on the geography of the state uh, would have led to, to fairly horrific civilian effects on the ground uh, that... I think raised serious concerns about the initial doctrine of, of R2P as it was initially proposed in 2001, uh, where one of the key factors for military intervention was reasonable prospects of success. And I'm not convinced that there was uh, or is in Syria in the context of intervening against the government. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think, yeah, there, there is a serious risk there. And, and you know, intervening against ISIS is different. Right, the, the, the assessments of whether you can make a difference there, the, the, I'm not sure one is being made in, in as significant degree as we might like, uh, but there's a greater prospect of that, uh, and there's a greater prospect of doing no harm, or at least doing some harm, but less than would have resulted absent intervention. Uh, yeah. We are <clears throat> unfortunately out of time. It's just past 2 o'clock, but I... Um, I want to thank all three of our panelists for not just for their great presentations, which whetted the appetite uh, to read the chapters, but for the discussion afterwards. These questions that we've been discussing and many of the chapters in the book are focused on recent uh, past interventions, uh, but they're very much live questions uh, still ongoing, and it's hard for me to imagine Maybe I'm biased because of my research interests, but it's hard for me to imagine you know, more important sets of questions than those relating to lessons from our interventions. So the good news is that you can read all about it, because this book is for sale right over there. Um, but having, and they didn't even ask, Steve didn't even ask me to make that um, you know, plug for the book. Um, but uh, with that said, I just want to thank uh, Chris, Gael, and Stephen uh, for the presentations on behalf of everybody here. Thank you. Thank you.